Today, we're going to be talking about strategies on how to compete to make sure you're the one that gets to buy the best businesses. I'm David C. Barnett, and you're tuned in to Small Business and Deal Making, the podcast, YouTube channel, and blog where I talk about buying, selling, financing, and managing small and medium sized businesses while controlling risk. So if you're looking to take control of your future through buying a business one day, or if you already own a business and you're looking to grow or exit, you've come to the right place. I talk about interesting things, I talk to interesting people, and I answer your questions every week right here. So be sure to hit like and be sure to hit subscribe, and let's get to it. Are you thinking of growing your business or beginning a journey into entrepreneurship? Take a shortcut to success by buying an existing and profitable business the right way. Visit businessbuyeradvantage.com and learn more about my online training, group coaching, and consulting services designed to help you win. Hey, so uh, I was I opened up my email the other day and I got an email uh, from Nunzio over at buyandsellabusiness.com. And uh, that's a platform for where people can advertise businesses for sale. It's their 10 year anniversary over there. And they put out a, a special report with a bunch of information and data about the last 10 years of them helping people connect, you know, people that want to buy and sell businesses. So uh, I was flipping through the document and if you head over to the website, I'm sure you can find it to download. And I found a few interesting bits of information in the document that kind of gave me this idea about, you know, making a video about how buyers can compete to be able to secure the best businesses out there that are for sale. So let me share my, uh, let me share my screen here. So this is the front cover of the report. Um, 10 years, 3.9 billion in connection value, uh, all put together in one, one report. Again, that's buy and sell a business.com where you can find that. Um, they hosted a great online, um, conference last year in early 2023. I was invited to come and give a talk and there were a lot of other speakers there as well. And I think that all the recordings are up on YouTube if you go check it out. But a couple of the interesting bits of information in this report that I want to cover with you, um, and so they put this uh, report together. And one of the bits of information I wanted to show you at the top of this screen is that buy and sell a business.com is talking about a 40% success rate, meaning that what I would assume anyway, it means that four out of every 10 businesses listed for sale, they're able to match up with a buyer on this platform. And they talk about how this is a double the industry success rate. And uh, very often I've used the term that four out of five businesses listed for sale online just don't sell. That's what this is making reference to. And so if so many businesses listed online don't sell, what can we generally draw from that statistic, right? It's that a lot of the businesses that are put up for sale are in some way undesirable or the sellers of those businesses maybe don't have correct expectations. They, they think that their business uh, is fantastic and worth a lot of money when maybe it's, it's not, right? Maybe it's not worth so much money or maybe it's not a very good business to begin with. Down at the very bottom of this page uh, is another very interesting statistic. It says that 92% of the users on the buy and sell a business.com platform are looking to buy a business. And this is the, the, the bit of data that I really want to highlight to everyone. Um, because back when I was a business broker, um, I would often notice that for every business I had for sale, I'd, there'd be like 10 buyers. Right. And so it really is an incredibly lopsided marketplace. There's there's all of these people looking to buy a business and it's not a new phenomenon. There's a lot more conversation online about this whole entrepreneurship through acquisition, like it's something that was invented uh, just recently. It wasn't. I mean, people have been buying businesses for a long time uh, back uh, when I was a full time broker, 2008 until the end of 2011. Uh, people were buying businesses like crazy. And there were always people looking for businesses. They were always these entrepreneurs looking to grow through acquisition or to buy a business, particularly people who had started a business at one time and didn't want to go through that again. Um, it's just recently somehow it's it's become a, a greater topic of discussion um, and in particular around uh, the search fund idea. And we're going to talk more about that today. But let's let's think about the, the fact that there are just so many buyers out there and what appears to be a relatively few number of businesses that go up for sale that are actually, quote unquote, worth buying, right? So 
So let me stop sharing my screen here. Okay. So there's a couple of different ways that I've seen people compete to get a business that they want, right? And if you've been in the marketplace or if you've ever made an offer in a business, you might, you know, lament some of these things that I'm going to that I'm going to say to you. But the very first way that I've seen people compete to buy the businesses that they really, really want uh, is to compete on price, right? And so what that simply means is that the buyer willing to pay the most is the one who ends up getting the deal. And so there's pros and cons to this. You know, the, the biggest pro obviously is that uh, you get the business. And I hear conversations online on other podcasts where people will talk about their acquisition deals and people will mention sort of the multiples of cash flow that they paid to acquire a business. And I'll be th thinking to myself, wow, does that even cash flow? Like that doesn't make sense. It, they paid way too much. And of course, that's the con is that if you're just willing to pay more than anyone else, what will ultimately happen is you can bid yourself up into a price where while you may end up with a business that is great today, right now, and maybe it's got a, a three to five year track record of improvement and good profitability, um, it may not turn out to be a great investment because if you pay too much for it, uh, you're not going to be adequately compensated for the risks that you take. And when the business invariably hits a rough patch, uh, and those earnings decline and the profitability declines, uh, you may be in a money losing position because you've over leveraged yourself, perhaps your finance payments are huge, et cetera, et cetera. So competing on price uh, is something that people do every day. Uh, it's not typically what I recommend unless you happen to be a buyer that's in a particularly unique situation. Um, like if, you know, you own, uh, I don't know, um, uh, a whole bunch of businesses and this business that's for sale somehow fits strategically within that array of businesses you already own. And you are quite literally going to be able to do more with that acquisition. Like you're going to reduce the costs across uh, your other businesses. And so they're all going to become more profitable through doing this acquisition or, or something like that. Right. Uh, and, and so that strategic acquisition, because I made a video um, and, and I put a comment or a post up recently on LinkedIn about businesses that have no asking price. And I, and I kind of criticized that, like you should put an asking price on a business. And one of the people that responded to that was a, a fellow named Rob, who used to be a mid-market broker in the UK. And he said, I've never put an asking price on a business. And, and that's because in the types of businesses he was trying to sell is he was specifically looking for businesses that would have uh, likely the strategic suitors out there who would see much greater value in that business because of the other stuff they had going on, like you know, a foreign business that wanted to enter a new market into the UK, maybe they would put a higher value on that business. And so that was a specific kind of thing that he was trying to do in that circumstance. And, and really, those are the only kinds of buyers that can really pay these crazy prices and for it to make sense in any way uh, from the point of view of the acquisition. There's all kinds of data out there that talks about post m a activity, you know, having a really difficult time actually paying out those dividends and synergies, et cetera, that people expect to find. So competing on price is number one. Pro is you get the business. Con may not be a great investment. Um, the second way that I've seen people compete for trying to get a business and, and make themselves more special in the eyes of sellers is to compete on terms. So, you know, we often think about buying a business with some kind of down payment, you borrow some money from a bank, and then you ask the seller to finance part of the deal. Well, if you have a lot of cash, you could make an all cash offer without needing bank financing, for example. And that would be more attractive for the seller because there wouldn't be the delays involved in getting the bank financing. Or maybe you don't ask the seller to do a seller's note, which is going to be more attractive to the seller because they can just cash out and walk away. They don't have any long-term obligation or something that ties them to your future success. Um, you know, the pros is it's attractive to motivated sellers in particular, people that want to get a deal done right away. Um, and so sometimes people will use the uh, this whole idea of competing on terms as a counterbalance to competing on price. So someone might come to the table and say, I'm not going to make the highest offer, but I'm going to make the offer that has the most attractive terms because I have a lot of cash. Um, I've often said that uh, a buyer with a lot of cash can sort of wield that cash like a stick, right? You can, you can kind of bully people with it because for sellers, 
the whole idea of just being able to get a big check on closing day and walk away is just very alluring, right? So the pros, obviously, it's attractive. The cons, um, number one, you're not taking time to apply leverage, which is going to have an effect on the returns that you're going to enjoy as a buyer. So your return on equity, for example. Uh, you can buy a business with cash and then try to lever it up after, but it's usually more difficult um, to do it that way. And of course, the biggest con is that uh, if you're not using any kind of seller financing, then you have not got a mechanism in place to hold the seller accountable if it turns out afterwards that there was any kind of misrepresentation or, or anything like that in the deal making. So again, I've, I've heard lots of people talk about how they got a deal and because of the competition between buyers, they made an offer without seller financing. Um, and then they had some kind of lament or regret afterwards when they found out something about the business and they go, wow, uh, well, I really wish I had a seller note, right? So that's another way that people compete. Um, third way that I've seen people compete to try to get the best businesses is to compete on human factors, right? So now we're, we're trying to get away from the objective numbers, sort of the hard-nosed business stuff, and we're getting more into the world of uh, touchy-feely kind of stuff. So competing on human factors basically means making yourself more likable to the seller. So what can that look like? Well, it can look like, um, you know, I don't know, being like uh, a person that the seller can more easily see themselves in maybe, you know, the uh, a term that I will often say is you want the seller to think that you are just like them, but 20 years younger, for example, um, or that other sort of human factors that are important to the seller are going to be better honored by you as the buyer. So you've heard people talk about sellers wanting to preserve the legacy of their business. You know, I want the name to carry on. I want the employees to be taken care of, et cetera. And so coming across as the buyer who is going to preserve those aspects is going to make you more likable. These are the human factors that I'm talking about. So the pros is that a seller may choose to give you a better deal. And, and quite literally, a seller uh, can do whatever they want. They, they can, you know, like, there's an example on my blog site. If you go to davidcbarnett.com, um, there's a tab called buy a business with no money where I generally, uh, sort of demonstrate why the idea of buying a business with no money doesn't really make sense and how it's difficult to pull off and broke people are really going to have a hard time ever doing it. But there is an example on there and it, it's based on a, a story, which is a, was a marketing message from a bank here in Canada called the BDC in which it describes a buyer selling a business entirely financed to the person that they wanted to sell it to, which was the manager that they had working in the business for several years. And so there's a video I made about that, um, that you can go and check out. Um, that seller really wanted that buyer to buy the business. And so they moved heaven and earth to make the deal happen. Right. And so this can be a very powerful way to compete. Um, the, the cons of this is that it often requires more time. And uh, if there are other people out there just willing to throw more money at the deal or willing to offer better terms, then you are relying upon the seller to purposefully choose these human factors over and above those other things. And so interestingly enough, I have a client right now who's in a scenario where uh, the seller could best be described as being a character, right? So this is a person that has a particular kind of personality and they are driven by different thoughts, whims, ideas, et cetera. Um, and they have an idea of who the buyer should be. And they have actually said no to some private equity investors, uh, private equity funds that have tried to buy the business because they don't like, they don't want to see themselves as, you know, selling out their business to, uh, you know, big high rise money interests or something like that. So my client, the buyer, has you know been fortunate to happen to find a particular kind of seller who is driven by uh, these particular types of ideas and values, uh, and they are going to be able to negotiate a deal with that person because of this, that they can position themselves as being a more attractive buyer uh, because of the way the seller sees their business and sees the world. It takes time to find a person like that, right? So. Let's move on. The other way that you can compete and think of, 
think about it just like a business might be thinking about competing with other against other businesses for customers. So the other way that you can compete is by niching, niching down, right? Is becoming more specific. So let's get back to the, to the slide that I just shared, right? So in the case of buy and sell a business.com, they're saying that 40% of the businesses advertised for sale were able to make a match with a buyer on the, on the platform. Uh, so 60% of them did not. So who are in that 60% group, right? Um, I, earlier, I just simply referred to them as undesirable, but why were they undesirable? There's a couple of different ways that a business is undesirable. Um, maybe the makeup of the clientele is not good. Customer concentration issues, for example. Uh, maybe the type of work that they do is not good. Project-based revenue versus, uh, you know, recurring uh, subscription revenue, for example, right? There's all kinds of characteristics a business might have that make it less desirable. So if you are more specific, instead of looking for a profitable business that has uh, an EBITDA of $400,000 or whatever your, your sketch is of what you want to look for, you say, I am looking for um, a machine shop that does this kind of work within this geographical area, um, you know, very specific. Well, maybe you can make your desired type of business that you want to buy so specific that other people are not necessarily going to be in that specific part of the market looking for those businesses. So, in order to pull it off though, you have to know about that kind of business. So you actually, if you're very specific, you're going to be able to have an expertise in that specific category. So I've often said that if you're going to buy a business, you should know something about that business. This is what I'm talking about, right? So if you've worked for 10 or 15 years in a particular industry, then obviously you're going to have more familiarity and expertise in that particular industry than someone who's a stranger on the outside. And so, I will often coach people to look at their background, look at their experience, look at the types of roles that they've had in different workplaces, think about the skills that they've established for themselves and where would those skills best be served, either in the types of businesses or particular industries or analogous industries. So, um, you know, if, if you have worked in roofing, you'll probably do really well in a company that builds fences, right? lots of similarities between those two things. So be specific. The pro, you become an expert and you can stand out from the generalists. So if somebody was going to, let's say, um, have two offers on a business, one from a generalist or one from someone who had just gotten out of business school who offered, you know, a million dollars for the business and the second offer was from somebody who had worked in that industry for a decade and was generally considered an expert in that field and also offered a million dollars for that business. But, um, you know, with a seller note, for example, um, the seller might actually choose the expert over the person who just got out of business school because the seller might think that the expert, the person with experience is going to be better qualified to run the business. And there's less risk associated with the seller note in that case, as an example, right? And so it's going to take longer, I think, for you to be able to set yourself apart with this expertise because you're going to have to have some kind of background or career where you're going to develop credible experience or knowledge in order to be able to then talk to sellers and say, yeah, I'm better qualified than other buyers because of all this stuff that I've done, right? And so when we start talking about time, this is another whole sort of topic when we talk about competition for businesses, um, particularly with, you know, search fund as a, as a conversational topic being out there. And so a lot of people maybe have read that Harvard Business Guide to Buying a Small Business, which I believe is not properly titled because they're talking about businesses that I would consider to be mid-market. They, they call a small business a business with 10 million in revenue. Um, and in that book, they describe the traditional, what is called the traditional search fund model, where someone will actually get investors to put money into a pot so the search funder can spend full time looking for a business to buy as a, as a full time job and draw a salary from the search fund. Okay. So the, the problem with full time search is that 
if you are spending your full time looking for a business, uh, obviously it costs money to live. So how are you going to afford to live, right? So there's going to be some sort of resource limitation on this activity. You are going to have to spend some money living. And so there's a time limit to this whole endeavor versus somebody who has a job and they spend part time looking for a business. That person's uh, you know personal expenses are taken care of because they have this job. They have this income coming in. And so the part time searcher can actually afford to search for a business for a longer period of time than a full time searcher. The The whole idea that time is against you really plays against the full-time searcher because they know that they're under the gun. They know that they have a limited amount of time. And what that does is it creates compulsion on the part of the searcher. So they have to do a deal within a certain period of time. And that then puts pressure on them to go out and make a deal happen, which can lead them to competing for deals using some of the earlier ideas that I talked about, competing on price, competing on terms. And so they're under the gun, they go out there, they need to buy a business because they need to secure a cash flow. They, as time goes on and their resources dwindle, they feel more and more pressure to get the deal done. And so they end up bidding things higher. They end up be getting you know, more favorable to sellers on the terms that they're asking for. And they end up undermining their own opportunity for success in the long term to try to get the deal under contract, right? And there's a lot of people out there talking about deals. There's a lot of people out there talking about successful deals. Very few people out there talking about how deals have gone bad. But I meet these people because they'll book consulting time with me because they'll sometimes want to talk about their deal and talk about their options and what they might be able to do, et cetera, et cetera. And if you tune into some of my holiday chat calls that, have, that I've done over the course of time, you can hear other people that have had poor outcomes in, in transactions. Um, and a lot of this is because they get eager and anxious and they go chasing after deals and they end up doing something that works against their best interests. I don't want to see you do that, right? That's, that's what this channel is about. This channel is about pragmatic advice and the real world of business, which is that business is difficult. It's hard. And there's a lot of risk involved. In fact, uh, it, I would say that small privately controlled business is the riskiest asset class that there is of the world of investing asset classes. Okay. So how can you then turn time from a disadvantage into an advantage? Right? So if you're, if you have some other means of income while you're searching for a business, then over the course of time, you can actually grow your resources, right? You can continue to save more money over the course of time while you look for a business every deal that you don't succeed in buying just means that, you know, you keep adding to your savings pool, which gives you more resources in order to get a deal done, right? So time makes you stronger. Additionally, if you're niching down, um, there's the search and there's the accumulation of resources, but then there's also the ability to develop yourself, right? So, I've had people before who will say, you know, this is the kind of business I'm looking for. I can't find it. Um, what do I do? Well, there's all kinds of things you can do, including personal development. What ways can you work on your own skills, knowledge, et cetera, in order to make yourself a better buyer and make yourself a better business owner, a better business manager, et cetera, once you do complete the deal. And all of those sort of self-development learning things, uh, are just going to make you better off period, right? So there's no reason not to do any of them. Uh, you know, reading books, studying different programs, getting experience, uh, you know, looking for the next challenge at work in your career, asking for opportunities to get involved in new and different stuff you haven't done before. All of this makes you a better employee, makes you more employable if things go south. Uh, will make you better at buying a business and will make you a better business owner and manager once you successfully complete a deal, right? So time gives you time to work on yourself and improve your resources and improve your opportunities for getting a deal done. The ultimate um, sort of best position I think to be in, to be a business buyer is to already be a business owner. In fact, I made a whole video about it back in 2023 
called Business Owner Advantages and Acquisitions, which we'll link to here somewhere and you can go check that one out. Um, but I'm not, you know, I know some people are going to say, well, you know, thanks, Dave, that's a lot of help. You're telling me that in order to buy a business, I should be a business owner. Well, there's a lot of chatter on Twitter. I, I follow a lot of people on Twitter and I see their conversations. And with interest rates having going up in the last year and a half, and a lot of sellers still not willing to adjust their prices that they're asking for, what we're seeing is that a lot of deals just don't make sense. And a lot of buyers can't pencil out a deal for it to make sense. And so what's going to happen? Well, I'm seeing more people online that used to be very big proponents of growth through acquisition who are now chatting on Twitter about how they're finding internal organic ways to grow their business. Uh, and it's less costly than doing acquisition. They're just investing in marketing and sales and improving the recruiting and, and stuff like that, right? The other thing I'm noticing is that a lot of the people on Twitter who are always talking about buying businesses are now having more conversations about startup, right? So they're saying, well, why would I spend four times SDE on a business where I could invest half of one times SDE in buying myself a 12 to 18 month runway in a new business startup. And then if I determine after a year that it's just not working, I could pull the plug on it and I would probably be in a much better, less risky position than if I leveraged myself up and overpaid for a business, which is all very logical, right? And so when I talk to sellers about this all the time, I'll say, you know, uh, there are limits to how much you can ask for because um, if the deal just doesn't make sense, people will find all their alternatives to get into business. So if you can't find a business that makes sense and you, and you, you know, spend years of time looking for a business that makes sense and you can't find a deal, maybe there are other ways that you can dip your toe into the world of entrepreneurship in a risk controlled way. Um, you know, this business that I own today, I started as a side hustle while I was working grew my clientele, started the YouTube channel, started writing books, et cetera. And so then when I got into it full time, it wasn't as risky as starting from zero with no income, right? That's something that I did. So the ultimate buyer leverage though, um, whether you own a business or you just have a job and you're looking for a business part-time, the ultimate buyer leverage in any negotiation is the ability to walk away. Uh, it's really the only thing that you can negotiate as a buyer is just the fact that you don't need to buy a business, that you can just back off. And the people that don't have this leverage are the full-time searchers and the professional investment type people like private equity groups, right? Like private equity buyers, they raise money with a view to buying assets like businesses and they have to deploy that capital in order to get the funds, in order for the money to go from just being cash to being assets under management so they can start collecting their fees. So those full-time searchers and those private equity type buyers, they have to do deals. And you know this is what leads them to the first two categories of competition, paying higher prices and competing on terms by giving sellers more of what they want. I want you to buy a business in a way that makes sense so you can have a good rate of return on your money and that you can control risk through things like seller notes, et cetera. And in my group coaching program, um, I've got a lot of buyers who, who are kind of people like this, where they have an income, they want to buy a business, but it's got to fit the right box. And let me tell you, it can be frustrating because time goes by, you look at deals and the deals don't quite work out and you make an offer and then the sellers want more and then you don't see how you can do it. And I have to continuously coach these people. If it doesn't work, back off. Like if it, like you can't meet every demand that a seller has or else you will end up taking all the future benefit that could possibly come to you from this deal and you will hand it to the seller in the present. Uh, and that's called indenturing yourself, right? Because you end up, then having to invest years of your life working in something and all the, the gravy or the juice was taken by the previous owner. And you don't want to end up in that situation. And so the frustratingly, people have to back off. And then something magical happens, right? And not every time, there's no guarantee. No guarantee this will happen. But a lot of the times people will say, look, this is my best offer. The seller will say, no, I need more. 
the buyer will back off. They'll say, okay, well, I can't make a deal with you. And then the seller goes off looking for someone who will. And maybe they meet with other buyers, they receive other offers, they negotiate with other people, and all those deals fall apart for one reason or another, usually because the buyers eventually realize that the deals don't work at those levels. And then one day, you start talking to that seller again. And sometimes it can be 6, 8, 12, 18 months later. You might have the opportunity to buy that business and the seller will have learned through their interactions with the market that, that what they are what they have always wanted may just not be possible, right? And so it's, it's not easy. And that's the best part about it. Because if this was an easy task, um, everyone would do it, right? 92% um, of these users, I'm gonna put this back on the screen again, 92% of the users on this website are looking to buy. Only 8% are sellers, right? There's a flood of people who are being brought into this world because they think that it's uh, going to be easy to find a business. They've heard phrases like uh, gray tsunami. They, they, they've heard people talk about the greatest transfer of wealth and business and blah, 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 right? Um, there, newsflash, there have always been people looking to acquire profitable businesses because a profitable business is a great thing to own, right? It's not news. And so in order to actually be one of the people that are successful and not just successful at doing a deal, but successful on day two, which means you do the deal, but then you're able to successfully operate the business in a cash flow positive way that allows you to pay off your debts and earn a superior rate of return so that it makes sense to risk your capital getting into this. To pull off all of those things, it's hard. And, and that means that you have to be willing to roll up your sleeves and do the work to prepare yourself, accumulate capital and resources to do a deal, build the networks, build the connections. You know, whether you're gonna look through websites like this one, whether you're going to go through brokers or whether you're going to independently go out and try to meet business owners and do a deal uh, outside of this uh, ecosystem of marketplaces. Um, all of it is hard work. And because it's hard work, all the people who just lackadaisically log on to a website just looking at listings, I mean, are they really competitors of yours if you're willing to do the work? I don't think so. When I was a broker, I used to get a flurry of emails. I would get, you know, 10 inquiries in one day from the same person who had looked at a bunch of my listings online and they were cutting and pasting the same sort of inquiry on each one, right? And I would get all these messages from obviously the same person and I would write them back and say, oh, I, I see you're interested in buying a business. Why don't you stop by my office one day and fill in an NDA and we can go through the book and I can talk with you about the businesses that might suit you once I know a little bit more about you. And like three quarters of those people never called or emailed me. Like they just, after spending an evening on a website, sending off emails, they, they gave up, right? And so, yeah, there's a lot of competition for good businesses, but a lot of the competitors are very strong competitors. Anyway, thanks for sticking around to the end. I hope you enjoyed the video. Any comments or questions, pop them in down below and, uh, and we'll see you next time. Cheers. So how can you learn more about buying, selling, financing, and managing small and medium-sized businesses? Easy. Go over to my blog site, davidcbarnett.com, where you can learn more about me and how I work with my clients. You can learn more about my books and courses that I've prepared for you. You can find out how to subscribe to my email list, the YouTube playlists, and more. There's literally hundreds of hours of content there, all for free, and I'd love for you to be my guest. Special thanks go to Mark Willis at Lake Growth Financial, today's video sponsor. Mark helps people better manage their personal and business finances through the bank on yourself insurance strategy. This is something I've done personally and I've seen others use it successfully for years. Go to newbankingsolution.com to find all the interviews I've done with Mark and learn more about the advantages of these programs. While there, sign up for a free consultation to learn what this solution might look like for you.